Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is the Soviet Union's mad scramble for nuclear weapons. In 1949, the Soviet Union became the second country to successfully test a nuclear weapon. In doing so, it beat the U.S.'s best intelligence estimates by four years. There are many reasons why the Soviet Union exceeded American expectations. For one, U.S. intelligence on the situation was generally problematic. For another, the Soviet Union had successfully integrated some German scientists into their program following the end of World War II. But the reason I want to focus on and try to explain today is that Stalin made the Soviet nuclear program the country's top priority. And it was this sort of pedal-to-the-metal attitude that got the Soviet Union across the finish line as quickly as they did. To give you an idea of Stalin's mindset, I want to take you back to a meeting between him and this man, Igor Kurchatov, the father of the Soviet nuclear bomb. Stalin approached Kurchatov because he was concerned that the program was not moving as fast as he wanted it to be moving. Kurchatov's response was that the program simply did not have enough funding to move that quickly. Moreover, Kurchatov thought it was inappropriate to approach Stalin on his own with this concern, given the general hardship that the Soviet Union was facing at the time. Stalin is not generally noted for his generosity, but here he was willing to make an exception. Rather than let that program fall behind, he showered it with more funds, gave higher salaries to the people involved, and even also gave them dachas and cars to make their lives a little bit better. Just how many resources went into the program? Well, the CIA estimates that between 330,000 and 460,000 people worked on the Soviet nuclear bomb, or about one in every 400 Soviets at the time. In contrast, the United States had only 130,000 people working on the bomb during World War II. So why the rush? Well, if we're going to think about why nuclear weapons are being built in general, we have to think about why negotiations fail. Why is it that the Soviet Union, the United States, and the United Kingdom couldn't reach some sort of agreement that convinced the Soviet Union not to develop a nuclear weapon? If we can answer that question, we might have a better understanding about why the Soviet Union was rushing to develop a nuclear weapon. The first bargaining friction to talk about is war exhaustion. At the end of World War II, both Churchill and Truman wanted to continue the intense security environment and put the pressure on the Soviet Union. It turns out that this did not go over well with their domestic constituents. Victory in Europe occurred on May 8, 1945, cementing Winston Churchill as a war hero. How did the citizens of the United Kingdom thank Churchill? By promptly voting him out of office. Just two months later, the Labour Party sweeps into power, gaining 239 seats in Parliament and making Clement Attlee the Prime Minister. Key to this Labour victory was the reorientation on rebuilding at home and laying down the security issues abroad. As a result, Attlee replaced Churchill in the middle of the Potsdam Conference, and he oversaw victory in Japan, not Churchill. Americans' response to Truman's focus on security issues followed a similar pattern. In the 1946 midterm elections, Republicans gained 55 seats in the House of Representatives, making Joseph Martin the Speaker of the House. Republicans also gained 12 seats in the Senate. It was a blowout going against Truman. All this is to say that Churchill knew that the United States and the United Kingdom didn't have much interest in fighting a war with the Soviet Union at the time. Think about how that affects bargaining dynamics. To reach a nuclear deal, the opponent begins by thinking about what the distribution of the policy in dispute would look like if the potential proliferator acquired nuclear weapons. In the present, the opponent offers a deal to the potential proliferator that is commensurate with what that future would look like. The only difference is that the opponent can steal a little bit for itself in the process of making this agreement, because the potential proliferator will not have to pay the costs associated with developing nuclear weapons. 
applying this to the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union. In a vacuum, the US and the UK should have offered concessions to the Soviet Union commensurate with what the Soviet Union would have expected to obtain by proliferating, and thereby convince Stalin it was no longer worth the effort to do so. All parties would have been better off as a result. However, that logic is under the assumption that the opponent prefers to prevent if the potential proliferator chooses to build. In other words, looking into the future, the opponent prefers fighting a war today to allowing the shift to transpire and make all sorts of concessions to the potential proliferator once the potential proliferator has acquired nuclear weapons. As we've discussed in theory-heavy lectures before, if the opponent starts off unable to credibly threaten preventive war, but then at a later date becomes credibly able to fight a preventive war, then there is going to be a reduction in the amount of concessions given. To convince the potential proliferator not to build when preventive war is not on the table, the opponent has to offer those concessions commensurate with what the proliferator would receive if it acquired nuclear weapons. But once preventive war becomes credible, we see that downward shift in the number of concessions given. Now the potential proliferator cannot credibly threaten to build nuclear weapons, because if it were to try, the opponent would intervene with preventive war. That's worse for the potential proliferator than not trying to build at all. In turn, the amount of concessions that the opponent grants to the potential proliferator is commensurate with the status quo distribution of power and is not factoring in what would happen with nuclear weapons at all. And so if you're Stalin, you can't rely on the United States and the United Kingdom giving you what you might want over the long term. Instead, you need to take the opportunity to build nuclear weapons while you can to acquire that power and then be able to leverage that power in the future to demand concessions and policy breaks from the US and the United Kingdom. And this is making sense out of that concern for speed. The Soviet Union knows that war exhaustion in the United States and the United Kingdom is not going to last forever. They have a window to build nuclear weapons, and it's closing. So if you have a closing window, you need to do everything that you can to get through it while it's still there. And that's what they were trying to do. There's a second issue with the same implication. But rather than being about war exhaustion, this topic is intelligence. During World War II, the OSS was so focused on stopping Germany and Japan that it had no intelligence assets on the ground in the Soviet Union at the end of the war. The transition from the OSS to the CIA was not immediately helpful either. Indeed, the CIA's first attempt to put spies into the Soviet Union in 1949 ended up with almost all of them either being immediately captured or killed upon arrival. All of this meant that the United States did not know exactly what to do to stop the Soviet nuclear program. In principle, they may have known that there were secret atom grads floating around the country, but they didn't know exactly where they were, and certainly didn't have this sort of pinpoint accuracy that I have on this map. In turn, the U.S. had two real options to try to fight a preventive war against the Soviet Union at the time, and neither of them were very attractive. First, they could have started a land war in Asia. Many have attempted to do this before, and there is sometimes initial success. Napoleon got to Moscow, after all, and Germany got all the way there but didn't succeed in taking it over. But what ends up happening is that the supply lines become enormous, and you start to suffer the ill effects of winter in the area. All of that means that actually trying to fight, invade, and take over all of the Soviet Union was probably not going to be a good idea. And that's part of the reason why these Atomgrads were so deep into the country. The other alternative discussed was to nuke all of the Soviet Union. If the Soviet Union no longer existed because it was essentially a crater in the Earth, then it could never develop a nuclear weapon. Ignoring the moral problem with that, there was a significant logistical hurdle as well. After World War II, many U.S. scientists in the Manhattan Project, including Robert Oppenheimer, left. They viewed their task within the Manhattan Project 
as developing nuclear weapons to stop Germany and Japan and win World War II. They didn't see this as their long-term future. So once World War II was over, they left. And that meant that the United States did not actually have enough nuclear weapons to destroy all of the Soviet Union, even if the U.S. wanted to and decided that was a good idea. And on top of all of that, there was a delivery problem. If the U.S. chose to take its 30 nuclear weapons and bomb the Soviet Union, it would have to put them on B-29 bombers. Those were slow planes, and so to be able to penetrate deep into the Soviet Union and bomb targets far away would require somehow them staying up in the air and not being shot down in the meantime. That just wasn't practical. But like war exhaustion, these problems were temporary. Inevitably, the CIA would go through its transition period and start to succeed in penetrating the Soviet Union. Moreover, the U.S. would eventually develop the U-2 spy plane, which would allow them to fly over the Soviet Union, take pictures, and figure out where those targets were. So again, put yourself in Stalin's shoes. Even if the U.S. offered a generous agreement today, Stalin had to be worried that tomorrow the U.S. might solve its intelligence problems and then have an ability to fight preventive war and deny Stalin those concessions. As a result, developing nuclear weapons, while costly and inefficient, locks in concessions into the long term and looks attractive as a result. There's a third mechanism that also helps explain the speed, although it's slightly different than the other two. It's spies. Some of those spies are famous, like Klaus Fuchs and the Rosenbergs. In fact, these spies were everywhere. The basic goal was to take as much information from the U.S. program and send it over to the Soviet Union. That would give the Soviet Union a head start. But they could also be used for troubleshooting. If the Soviet Union was having a problem replicating something or doing something on its own, it could go to the spies and have those spies figure out information that it needed to overcome those problems. Once again, though, it was inevitable that the U.S. would eventually shift its focus away from Germany and Japan and to the Soviet Union instead. And once that were to occur, these Soviet atomic spies may no longer be in business. And from there, the Soviet Union could no longer use them to troubleshoot what was going on with the program. So for one last time, put yourself into Stalin's shoes. Right now, the Soviet Union has a relatively easy pathway toward nuclear weapons. In the future, though, that easy route may be shut off. And at that point, the U.S. could reduce its concessions and still convince the Soviet Union to accept an agreement. In turn, the Soviet Union's best option is to develop nuclear weapons while it can at the cheaper rate and force those greater concessions to be implemented in the long term. And so across all three of these mechanisms, we're obtaining the same implication. The U.S. cannot credibly commit to concessions over the long term, and that forces the Soviet Union's hand to develop a nuclear weapon as fast as it can. That wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.